What's the problem with your friend? I need to know. Get the police stop! With a gun! With a gun! Hurry you're, you're up! With a gun! Please, hurry up! He's killing my girlfriend! What is the problem? He's killing my friend! Who's killing your friend? Get my chimpanzee! Oh, your chimpanzee Please. is killing your friend! Yes. In the afternoon of February 16th, 2009, a 240-pound, 14-year-old pet chimpanzee named Travis wasn't cooperating with his owner, Sandra. She had just returned from a weekend away where she spent time at a casino with her friend and employee, Charla Nash. For the trip, Sandra pampered Charla, giving her some money to gamble, and she also took her to get her hair colored and curled. And when Sandra came home, Travis Travis wanted to be treated as well. She tried doing that for him by giving him a lunch of fish and chips and ice cream cake, but that wasn't exactly his version of being treated. He wanted nothing more than to go for a car ride. Becoming more agitated throughout the day, Travis managed to elude Sandra at one point and grabbed a set of car keys and unlocked the front door. He made his way out onto the property and darted from each of Sandra's cars, indicating that he wanted to be driven somewhere. Somewhere. Sandra lived on a large property with a long driveway, but that still wasn't enough space for Travis. He wanted to go somewhere else. Sandra tried to coax him inside with food and the opportunity for him to draw and to pet their cat. At that point, it was after 3 p.m. and time for his afternoon cup of tea. So Sandra put the anti-anxiety pill Xanax in his cup of tea to try and calm him down. He did consume it, but he was still unruly. So then she got on the phone with her friend Charla, the person who she had just had a lovely weekend away with, and Sandra asked her if she could come over and help get Travis back inside. Although Sandra claims that it was Charla who volunteered to come over. But regardless, Charla made her way over to the house with a Tickle Me Elmo toy that she hoped would entice Travis. When she reached the top of Sandra's driveway, she stepped out of the car and held the Elmo toy over her face. But it didn't work how she was hoping it would work. It acted as one big red target. Travis charged toward her on all fours before standing up on his two back feet to attack. His force knocked her into the side of her car and then onto the ground. It was there that he started to rip into her body. Sandra first verbally tried to get Travis to stop the attack, but much like how he had been ignoring her efforts throughout the day, he continued to ignore her. She then picked up a snow shovel and started banging him across the head with it repeatedly, but when that proved to be pointless, she raced inside and grabbed a long butcher's knife. While Travis still ripped and chewed into Charla's face, scalp, and hands, Sandra plunged the knife into his back. Without much of a reaction to that, she stabbed him another two times. And that was when she did get a response. He halted his attack on Charla, turned around, and looked at Sandra. He looked at me like, Mom, what did you do? That didn't last long, and he quickly continued his attack breaking almost every bone in Charla's face. It was at that point she realized there was nothing she could do to stop Travis, so she ran into one of her nearby cars and called the police. When the police arrived, Travis had stopped and was roaming the property. He charged toward the police car, first knocking off the driver's side mirror. He then moved around the vehicle and tried to open the passenger's side door, but it was locked. He then went back around to the driver's side door, which wasn't locked, and he opened it. Travis looked at the officer, bearing his blood-covered teeth. The officer then aimed a gun at Travis and fired four bullets into him. He reacted the opposite to Sandra's knife. He let out one final screech and then defecated before retreating inside the house. When it was safe to do so, the officer exited his car and saw bits of scalp and fingers strewn across the yard. Charla's body was partially naked and covered in blood, and because she was so badly mutilated, the officers couldn't tell whether she was a man or a woman. Surprisingly, Charla was still conscious, but it was assumed she was dead. So they didn't immediately inspect Charla's body and instead followed Sandra inside who had gone to find where Travis went. Travis had limped through the house to his living quarters where he died. It wasn't until the police left the house that they saw movement from Charla. I guess they said Sandra come over and looked at me and said oh she's dead she's dead so she walked away and then the officer went with her in the house 
to see where Travis was. And I guess he had been consoling her a while. And they said, when the officer and Sandra came back outside, I lifted my arms straight up, like, hey, help me. And he, he, he responded, oh my God, they're still alive. Charla was alive and she survived. Hi everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel. As you might have guessed, today's video is going to be on Travis the Chimp. Most people know him from the attack that I just went over, but there is much more to his story. So now I want to talk about how Travis ended up as Sandra's pet. Travis's parents were Susie and Coco, and they were paired together by chimp breeder Connie Casey in Missouri. When there was demand to have chimps as pets, they were the biggest chimp breeders in the United States. And if you ever saw a movie with a chimp on it, or a greeting card with a chimp on it, it was more than likely one of their chimps or related to one of their chimps. Connie first started her chimp collection with two wild caught chimps, a male and a female. The male was Coco, Travis's dad, who she purchased for $12,000. At the time, one level of Connie's house was a pet store, so she had no shortage of resources to look after these chimps. And because she quickly became known as a chimp breeder, she soon became the depository for a number of unwanted chimps. Some of those chimps came from obsolete research projects. Because of their similarities to humans, a number of chimps were captured in the 1920s for medical and behavioral studies. And then in the 1950s, NASA captured a bunch more chimps to send them to space. They were often subjected to cruel testing and the possibility of being sent on a more than likely fatal trip to space. But those who survived the journey to space or finished whatever research they were undergoing usually didn't end up in much better situations. Those who ended up in Connie's care were subjected to a lifetime of stress, torment, and imprisonment. Connie kept some of her chimps in dirty glass cages with little enrichment. Others were kept in cages that had an outdoor portion, but when they went outdoors, they would be agitated by barking dogs. And others were just simply kept inside. Yeah. And then him. And that's Tonka. In 2001, Travis's mother Susie and two other chimps escaped their unlocked cage. They ventured over to a neighbor's house where the teenage boy living there shot and killed Susie. I will be making kind of a part two to this video where I will talk about the Susie situation and the neighbor who shot her. While making this video, I fell down the pet chimp trade rabbit hole and all of the insane people that are in it. And there is so much to go over with that, so I thought I would make a separate video about that. And I actually found out that the people who made the Tiger King documentary are actually making a documentary about all of this. So yeah, I will be getting into lots of interesting stuff in my video. Also, this is what Connie had to say about the Travis incident. Travis situation was a very uh, unusual and horrible thing to happen, you know. He shouldn't have been out of the cage. You knew him a little bit? I knew his mom. Yeah. Yeah. Is she here? Oh, I meant his human mom. Oh. Speaking of Travis, Susie, who was an 11-year-old retired zoo chimp, gave birth to him on the 21st of October, 1995. Three days later, Mike and Connie Casey tranquilized Susie and took Travis away from her. He was then purchased for $50,000 by his new human parents, Sandra and Jerome Herold. Sandra named him after her favorite singer, Travis Tritt. And from that day, Travis was raised as a human. He wore a diaper and Sandra bottle fed him formula. She burped him and he slept in a crib in their bedroom. When he started to walk, they taught him how to use the toilet and how to brush his own teeth. He also had a wardrobe full of his own clothes that Sandra would often dress him in. Every day he would eat breakfast and dinner with him and if they went to a restaurant to eat, he would go with them as well. Some of his favorite foods were filet, mignon, lobster tail, lint chocolate, 
chocolates, taffy, and nerds candy. He even worked out how to tell when the ice cream truck was coming down the street, so he would pester Sandra until she took him to get an ice cream. He was even able to open the refrigerator and pour himself a drink into a glass. He also knew how to drive a ride-on lawnmower, as well as drive a car. He liked taking rides in cars, I read. Yeah, he did. Did he, he was able to open doors by himself? He could drive. He took off with the car a couple times. <laughs> Onto the regular streets? Yeah. Down, that seems a little dangerous. Our shop. Well. Acting was also one of his many talents. He appeared in a TV show pilot and a number of commercials. He also got to be known pretty well within the local community. Sandra and Jerome owned a tow truck company and Travis would often accompany them to tow vehicles. The police also got to know Travis, often taking photos with him whenever they saw him. Another person who got to know Travis was Charla Nash. Sandra and Charla Charla had been friends for more than 30 years after riding horses together in Loretta Lynn's traveling rodeo in the 70s. It was there that they had one of their first encounters with a chimp. In one of the rodeos, they saw a chimp riding a horse wearing a western outfit. Sandra became immediately in love. She went and pursued the chimp backstage and gave him some gummy bears. The next time she watched the chimp perform, he spotted her in the crowd, jumped off the horse, and leapt into her arms, and that would ultimately lead to her purchasing Travis. Charla saw Travis twice when he was little, once when he was still being bottle fed and Sandra took him into the tow truck office, and another time at Sandra's home when he was a little bit older. During that time, she played with Travis, letting him crawl all over her and mess around in her blonde hair, and she became much more involved with Travis later on in his life. When she started working for Sandra, her job was to answer phone calls for the tow truck company, but also do some odd jobs for her. And most of those odd jobs pertained to Travis. She had to clean his cage, shop for him, and collect newspapers to line the bottom of his cage with. While life with Travis may have been running relatively smoothly, things in Sandra's personal life were falling apart. Sandra's daughter Sue was moving away, and that was already a pretty big blow to Sandra, but what made it worse was when Sue was transporting some of her belongings during a night in September 2000, her car veered off the highway and struck a tree. Sue was ejected from the car and died from her injuries. After her daughter's death, Sandra became depressed. She grew distant from her friends and struggled to maintain a relationship with her grandchildren that her daughter left behind, and at one point she even considered suicide. And then a few years later, in October 2003, her and Jerome had an issue with Travis. One evening, Sandra needed to retrieve something from the tow truck office, so they all got in the car, including Travis, to go and do so. But what would have been just a normal car ride took a turn for the worst. When they stopped at some traffic lights, a pedestrian threw an empty bottle of soda through the partially open window of the car and struck Travis with it. He then unbuckled his seatbelt, got out of the car, and chased the man, but didn't catch him. When he gave up on pursuing the man, he played on the road and blocked traffic, refusing to get back in the car. Sandra tried to lure him back in with cookies and ice cream, but nothing worked. He would sometimes go in the car, but as soon as he got in, he would then open the door again before they got the chance to lock it and get out. That continued for two hours while traffic was held up and cars were honking. The ordeal ended when Travis simply wore himself out. He just got back in the car and buckled his seatbelt. No charges were pressed and several police officers who knew Travis personally wrote in their reports that his behavior was only playful. But the incident led to a new law being passed in Connecticut where someone could not own a chimp if it weighed more than 50 pounds. And if you did want to own a chimp under 50 pounds, you had to get a permit to own it as well. The law was not enforced on Sandra and Jerome because they had Travis before the law was made and because they had had him for so long. And then from March 2005, Jerome started spending a lot of time in hospital because of a rapidly spreading stomach cancer. One night in hospital, Jerome suggested to Sandra that she send Travis to a sanctuary after he dies. He said it would be the best for both her and Travis because Travis would be too much for her to manage on her own. 
and then the next month Jerome died. Zendra mourned in a similar way to how she did when her daughter died. She grew distant from everyone in her life and ignored condolences. Travis mourned in his own way too. He would take photos of Jerome off the walls and press his lips to the glass. That was also when Travis started rocking back and forth in the same place for hours. It wasn't until a year later that Sandra started to seriously consider what Jerome told her because she sat down and wrote a letter to a woman who owned a animal sanctuary in Florida. The only excerpts I've been able to find of this letter are the last two paragraphs. They're on the screen if you want to read them in full. But basically in the letter she talked about the things that her, Jerome, and Travis would do together and how Travis responded to Jerome's death. She said she was worried about what would happen to Travis if she were to suddenly die and wanted to organize something before that happened. She ends off by saying she enclosed a donation in the envelope and that she would be flying to Florida to attend an event they were putting on. She also put some photos of Travis and the family in the envelope and a check for $250. She ultimately did not mail that letter and did not fly to Florida, but I'm sure she wished she did when a few years later in 2009, Jerome's concerns became a reality. She couldn't manage Travis and that is when Charla was mauled. After the attack and Travis had died, his body was loaded into the back of a police vehicle and then transported to the University of Connecticut for a necropsy. Travis's head was removed and taken to the state laboratory for a rabies test. After the necropsy was completed, Travis's body was taken to the crematorium, and that is when Sandra went to go and visit him. She took his favorite shirt to him to wear when he was being cremated, and she was completely shocked to see that his head had been taken off. The head ended up testing negative to rabies, but Xanax was found in his system. Sandra initially told NBC that she gave Travis Xanax five minutes before the attack. She was trying to calm Travis down and gave him tea in this mug. Tea with the antidepressant, Xanax. How long was that before the attack that you gave him the Xanax? Five minutes, if that. Do you think the Xanax had some kind oh, of... Oh no, five minutes. And she also told police she gave it to him. And then she did an interview with the Associated Press where she backtracked a little and said she had never given him anything. Had you given him the Xanax? Never, or? never, yeah. never. And, and it was a friend that was here, he forgot it. And it wasn't a prescription. It wasn't anything. He's never had anything. So you've never, never given him anything. Never, 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 and, never. And Sandy, what about never the used a hot shot on him like Pete, some people do. He's never had anything but love. Never. And the reason why the Xanax is so important is because it may have been the reason why Travis decided to attack Charla. While it is an anti-anxiety medication in humans, it can sometimes cause rage, mania, hallucinations, and aggression. It was also revealed that Travis was on Lyme disease medication as well, and that can cause mood swings, paranoia, and panic attacks. So that also may have been the cause of the attack, or maybe it was the combination of that plus the Xanax. Another reason why Travis may have attacked was because Charla's hair was a little bit different from how it usually was. But yeah, at the end of the day, it's not 100% clear why Travis attacked. But after the incident, another two people came out and said that they had some kind of run-in with Travis previously. One was from 1996 and the other was from 1998. The one from 1998 is believed to be a lie by pretty much everybody, but the one from 1996 did happen. I asked her if I could say hello to the, I thought he was a monkey uh, at the time. She said, absolutely. So I started reaching to shake his hand and uh, he grabbed it when it got to the side view mirror on her side and started pulling me towards, you know, inside the car. And then he, I'm pulling back and he bit down on my hand. She was not seriously injured. The bite broke the skin, but says she couldn't get authorities or the media back then to listen to her warnings. Chimp owner Harold says that her animal's encounter back in 1996 was not unprovoked. I mean, she just went like this inside the car, not, not outside the car, inside, and it was a Corvette. You know, there's not much room. And I had somebody on the other side, Travis was sitting on his lap, and she just 
threw her hand right into, oh, I love chimps, I love chimps. From all this, a discussion arose around whether chimps should be kept as pets. Animal experts are saying that chimps shouldn't be pets. They're dangerous, they're animals, and this is what can happen. They're the closest thing to human, the closest thing to us. Their DNA, we can give them a blood transfusion, they can give us one. How many, how many people go crazy and kill other people? This is one incident that I don't know what happened. After the incident, Charla was rushed to the Stamford Hospital where she spent seven hours in surgery by four different teams of surgeons. When she arrived at the hospital, her nose was hanging on by a thread and all of her lips, eyelids and fingers had been ripped off. Travis broke her jaw off her face and destroyed her mid-face bone structure, as well as giving her significant brain tissue injuries. One of her thumbs was able to be reattached sideways, and her jaw was also able to be reattached. Her eyes actually were still intact when she arrived at the hospital, but the doctor did have to eventually remove them because of some disease that she contracted from Travis. Most of you don't know this, but I contracted a disease from Travis in my eyes and the doctors had to remove them. And that's why I'm blind today. And diseases from Travis weren't the only things that were left in her face. We found extensive dirt, chimpanzee hair, and several chimpanzee teeth implanted in the bone. I couldn't believe that this woman was awake and conscious when she came in. The hospital provided counselling to their staff members who initially treated Charla because her injuries were so extreme. And once she was stabilised, she was then transferred to the Cleveland Clinic. She was able to stay there on a semi-permanent basis where she had living quarters and was assisted every day. And her twin brother and her daughter were her biggest supporters during that time. A couple of months after the attack in April, her medical expenses had amassed to over $700,000, and she did not have insurance. A trust fund was set up to help Charla pay for some of her medical fees, but since she was looking at a lifetime of assisted living, she needed to sue. On Charla's behalf, her brother filed a $50 million lawsuit against Sandra for recklessness and negligence. The lawsuit alleged Sandra knew Travis was dangerous, but failed to confine him to to a secure area and she continued to let him roam her property. It also claimed Sandra gave Travis medication that exacerbated his violent propensities. A month later in May 2009, a judge froze Sandra's assets at $10 million, so she wasn't able to transfer or sell anything. The agreement included six properties owned by Sandra, the tow truck business, and an interest in her late husband, Jerome's estate. Sandra's lawyers did try and push back a little bit. They claimed that because Charla was an employee of Sandra, that it should have been covered by workmen's compensation, not a civil lawsuit. But Sandra wasn't able to get out of the lawsuit. Also, towards the end of 2009, the state decided that they would not be pressing criminal charges against Sandra. Basically, they said that it was legal for Sandra to own Travis and that he hadn't shown any violent behaviour before. So that was that. So Charla was just stuck in a state of feeling trapped in her own body. I consider myself, I feel like I'm locked up. I feel like I'm in a cage. Sandra, however, began moving on with her life, but it wasn't easy. Pretty much immediately after the attack, Sandra began receiving harassing phone calls from people, but not because her chimp almost killed somebody, but because it was her fault that her chimp died. Some people given these calls like I would have rot in hell for killing them. I mean, here's something that was like my son. There's my best friend. In, in seconds, minutes, what do you do? Sandra and her relatives assumed that it was Peter making those phone calls, but Peter denied doing that. Sandra's close relationship with Travis was also a point of controversy. It was heavily suggested that Sandra had some kind of sexual relationship with him. This has been reported back and forth. I don't know if you ever heard of it. There was thing talks about sexual relations with it. You know, it's funny. And I, I was thinking that and I go, I don't, probably no one ever heard that. I did hear it. I don't, I can't swear to, I, but I did hear that. But she made a joke to me, you know, like that day. She goes, oh, he's in my bed with me. And I laughed it off. Oh, that's, 
Since she loved chimps so much, she turned her attention to a living one, and she got another one. It was a one-year-old male chimp named Chance. And much like Travis, he originated from out of state. But unlike Travis, that is where he stayed. She would visit him and send money to the woman who was looking after him, but she knew she would never be able to bring him back to Connecticut. Later on in life, Chance was used in the entertainment industry. He appeared in the Wolf of Wall Street movie, and he was also seen at a roadside zoo being yanked around by a leash. And when she wasn't with Chance, she got her animal fix by leaving food out for the raccoons and feeding the deer in her yard. But when she couldn't distract herself with animals, she would constantly call her friends, crying and talking about Travis. And then in May 2010, 15 months after the Travis attack, Sandra's chest began hurting. She made it to the hospital and was prepped for surgery, but then her lungs started filling with blood. She died of a ruptured aortic aneurysm. Her lawyer made a statement basically saying that her broken heart just couldn't take it anymore. She was then buried with Travis's cremated remains in her casket. She may have been dead, but the lawsuit with Charla was very much still going ahead. It was just then against her estate. In the meantime, Charla received a full face and hand transplant, all paid for by the U.S. military. But in 2011, she received a full face transplant, paid for by the U.S. military. The Pentagon is also funding Nash's follow-up treatment at a cost estimated in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Charla was going to be studied by the military, and they hoped that they would be able to learn some new things about those kinds of transplants for veterans that had similar injuries. The transplant took 20 hours with 14 surgeons working. After the attack, Charla's left hand was amputated up to the mid forearm, so they were able to attach her new one starting from there. And as for her right hand that still had a thumb attached, they were able to attach just a section of the donor's hand, allowing Charla to keep her own thumb. Unfortunately, after the surgery, there just wasn't enough blood flow to Charla's transplanted hands, so they had to be removed. Even though her hands didn't last, she was still very happy for the contribution she made to help service men and women. But the study is not a failure, it's a success. It learned so much from all night testing. Charla remained positive and believes that she will one day be able to ride a horse again. And I'm ready, I wanna ride horses again. Do you think you will? I will. She was also very happy with her face transplant. Ever since the attack, so for almost three years, she had eaten nothing but pureed food. But the face transplant gave her teeth and a palate, so she was then able to eat more solid food. She would also be able to breathe again through her nose and regain her sense of smell. She also didn't attend her daughter Brianna's high school graduation in 2010 because she was concerned she would distract everyone. So after her face transplant, she was hopeful she would be able to attend Brianna's college graduation in 2013. I couldn't find out if she attended her college graduation or not, but I'm sure if she was up to it, she would have attended. It wasn't until November 2012 that Charla got her day in court. One of the people who testified was Marcella Leone, the owner of a private zoo in Greenwich. She talked about how in September 2008, Sandra left her a frantic voicemail, which was similar to the frantic 911 call she made. In the voicemail, Sandra was screaming over the phone, asking for her to bring over a tranquilizer gun to sedate Travis because he wasn't cooperating and he was out of his cage. By the time Marcella listened to the voice message, the situation resolved itself before anyone got hurt. But she was so concerned about that voicemail that she contacted a state department of environmental protection official about it. Marcella played the voicemail for them and the official said that they would do something about it. About a month later, the official sent a memo to a couple of other officials saying that Travis was an accident waiting to happen. That a memo from a state biologist just four months before the animal went on the rampage shows the state should have ordered it removed. The memo in October of 2008 says in part, quote, I would like to express the urgency of addressing this issue. 
it is an accident waiting to happen, close quote. When it was all said and done, Charla received about $4 million from Sandra's estate. The settlement agreement filed called for Sandra's estate to provide Charla with millions of dollars worth of properties, hundreds and thousands of dollars in cash, and hundreds and thousands of dollars of things like vehicles and equipment and machinery. Ever since the attack, Charla's lawyers have been talking about suing the state for $150 million. And since the Sandra lawsuit was done and dusted, they were ready to do that. They turned a deaf ear on a foreseeable risk. The result was devastating to Charla. We're only asking you to do one thing, and that is give us the right to go to court. But the state is immune from lawsuits unless they are approved by the claims commissioner, and it was ultimately blocked by the claims commissioner. The state, when it regulates a particular uh, activity, in this case, owning of animals, it doesn't owe an individual duty uh, to a, a specific individual for legal enforcement, it owes a duty to the public at large. Charla and her lawyer did make one more attempt in 2014 to sue the state. I'm hoping that I can have a lawsuit that will allow me the means to um, pay my medical bills and, and the chance to live a comfortable life. And just as important, I, I want to make sure that what happened to myself never happens to anyone else again. But it was once again blocked by the claims commissioner. Throughout all of that and still to this day, Charla advocates for stricter laws around owning exotic animals. I'm here today to make sure that what happened to me never happens to anyone else ever again. But yeah, that is pretty much everything for this video. My next video will be about all of the chimps that are still kept in people's backyards and in people's homes, the animals that Charla is lobbying to help free. And they really do need freeing because they are in some pretty bad situations. So anyways, thank you so much for watching this video. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are in the comment section below. And don't forget to drink water, be nice to animals, and let's take a moment of silence for everyone who has to deal with Karens. And I will see you in my next video.